Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your house worshiping your name, whether we are in person or online. Lord, we ask for your presence to be with us now as you in turn have a message for us. Lord, may we have attentive ears to hear, and and may our focus be on what it should be on, and that being your word and your message to our hearts. Holy Spirit, come before us now and fill us, fill this place. Uh, Guide my tongue as I preach your word, God, and may it be clear and accurate. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Hey, you can have a seat. Good morning. I hope you're having a decent summer so far. Yeah? Yeah. M- mine, mine has been okay. Oh, good. Yours too. Um, yeah, fantastic. M- my summer has been marked by a kitchen renovation. And, and whether you live in an apartment, condo, house, if you're considering renovation of your kitchen, I have some advice for you. Don't do it. Like, seriously, don't do it. Um, no, it's been, it's been fun. Um, messy, um, challenging. Uh, it's kind of like camping, except at your house. And you got to wash the dishes outside or, or, you know, on the ground or in the sink. And, and you do everything over an open fire or a grill, for that matter. Yeah, it's been fun. You ever experienced that? You're looking at me like this is foreign or something. We had to tear out the cupboards and, and the kitchen down to what we call the studs. I don't know if you've ever seen the interior of your walls. We've seen it for a little while now before they were rebuilt in themselves. But there's nothing special, that's why I bring it up, nothing special about the interior of the house. The studs are kind of that inner bone structure of, of the house. There's nothing special about it at all. It's why we cover it up. But let me tell you, it is the most important part to the integrity of the structure or the home, isn't it? It's the most important important part, Rick would know. Anyway, um, we want to talk about structures ourselves because, you know, it's true of every organization, it's true in so many things in life, that the in- interior, the bones, the structure, the foundation is the most integral part to the integrity of the home. And so from time to time we ask questions like, is it healthy? Thankfully, the interior of the kitchen was healthy, was fine, but the exterior had to be dealt with. But what about the interior? We ask these questions from time to time because it matters for the organization. It, It matters for, in this case, specifically the church as we consider the very structures that make up who we are and what we do and why we do it. You heard a little bit about it in the introduction to uh, uh, the sermon series in the worship, but we're starting a new sermon series about the five theological distinctions that make up our core dogmas, doctrines, and beliefs. And if you don't know what any of those three words mean, I'm glad you're here. Okay? Dogmas, doctrines, the things that we believe, the things that make up what we believe and why we believe them. If I were to summarize the sermon series in one paragraph, I'm going to have it before you on the screen. Uh, These are kind of the fundamental principles that came out of the Reformation period, a period that truly changed the world. I believe it was Life magazine that said Martin Luther was one of the three, top three most influential people in the history of the world. Okay? Interesting. But, but here's what came out of that period of time. Uh, we want to be a church and continue to be a church, and we should be a church, and we'll explain why I'm saying this, that finds its authority in Scripture alone. Solas is Latin for only or alone. Scripture alone. And why is that? We'll talk about that. A church that finds its authority in Scripture alone and that we would know that we are justified and saved by grace. There's a little more to it. In Jesus Christ alone, so that we would live for one purpose, and that would be to glorify God alone. There's a summary. Now, there's so much to that, and I want to unpack that as we get into the series. What's governing the church today? What's our authority? What should be? Let's talk about, let's talk about the authority of the Scriptures, and let's talk about it from 1 Thessalonians 2. 
So if you go there with me, we preach from the Word of God because we believe these are the core tenets of our faith. We believe that God has preserved His Word. Uh, and this is very important to understand, and we preach directly from it for a reason. So we're going to do that while we talk about it as well. First Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 9. Okay, you ready? Boy, that was convincing. You ready? Yeah. For you remember, brothers, it just means believers, our labor and our toil. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. This is modern-day Greece. You could go to this area today. They were establishing an early church there. For you remember, believers, our labor and our toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Trained in the Torah, eyewitnesses the account of Jesus dying and rising again from the dead and Him appearing to them before He went to heaven and commissioned them to go. They're declaring the gospel just as it was passed on from generation to generation, declaring the gospel to this church and from generation to generation it has been declared. It has been penned into existence, but it has been declared, that being the word of God and the gospel of of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. Verse 10. You were witnesses, and we are too. And God also, how holy and how righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father to his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you. Now, he's not gloating. Uh, it, 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 it's a way of speaking in which you would write to convince or to show that the word that they are sharing is trustworthy. So what he's really saying is, you know that both by our conduct and our speech, that we are trustworthy. And he goes on to say this, For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. We need to hear that too. That, that's for us too. We have a purpose, church. We are to walk in a manner worthy of God. For all the world is watching in an age of moral decline. And by the way, same, same in the church at Thessalonica. Okay? Don't even want to get into the culture in which Paul is preaching. What they did in worship, what they worshipped, how they worshipped, that sort of thing. Anyway, that's for a whole other time. You are witnesses, right? It says... And what are you witnesses of? That we, we taught you, we exhorted you, we charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Then it says this, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And th this is kind of the, 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 the fundamental idea behind what we're getting into in this new sermon series. That, that we are citizens in God's kingdom and our purposes are for his glory. But what does that look like? Well, we're going to learn that from the five solaces. Where we're going to camp out today, though, is in verse 13. Look there with me. And we also thank God constantly. We pray and we thank God that when you received the word of God, he's speaking to the church, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men or mere opinion is what he means by that, but as what it really is. What does it say? It is what? It's the Word of God. That's what it really is. We're so thankful that you accepted it that way. You humbly accepted it that way. And then it says this, which is at work in you believers. And, and what I want to talk about today is just, is just really these two things. That is, our authority, what's at work in us. It really can only be two things. And I'm going to tell you why it can only be two things if you don't trust what I am saying. I'm going, to, I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to show to you why it's only two things. But what is our authority? We're going to look at both what it is, but also what our options are, so to, so to speak. What's at work in us? That's where we begin. When we talk about sola scriptura, uh, Latin for alone, scripture only, we're talking about the fact that it's God's word in contrast to the opinion of people or the ways of popular society. So it's, it's like one or the other, so to speak. And when we talk about that, we mean final authority. That gives us everything we need to know for life and faith and the things that are eternal. So, so it's the final authority on the things that matter. Salvation, origin, that sort of thing. Now, that is not to say... 
Pay attention now. That is not to say that we throw out reason and logic. That is not to say that there are no other sources worthy of our ears. There's no other books worthy of being read. Okay? If, if I destroy the plumbing that's going from the upstairs through the kitchen down to the basement, if I snap the plumbing, the, the piping of the return water that is to flow out of the house and not into my kitchen, which by the way I did, okay, if I do that, I'm probably not going to go to the Old Testament and look at you know the, the, the construction of the temple to learn how to fix my plumbing. Right? Right? I could, but it probably isn't going to help me in that. Okay? But I could go to a YouTube channel that has a professional teaching you how to fix what you just destroyed. Okay? Or, or, or you could call up a, a guy who knows what he's doing to help you do it. Uh, these are the things that I'm describing I actually did. Okay? And it is fixed. I hope and pray. Anyway. But I bring that up to say it's not as if we don't have any other things to listen to or have any other sources. It's a contrast is what we're saying here. It's the final authority. In church, it's the final authority not only for us but the church, what we do and what we're about. And that's what I want to unpack today as we talk about this. And it's important to consider the alternative when we think about, well, what is our source and why does the church have this source and why does it matter? It's important to consider what our alternative is. In other words, if it's not the word, what is it? Another way of putting it in this sense, there are only two types of churches. And I'm going to explain this. Those who are led by the Spirit and the Word and those who are led by something that Romans 8, 12 through 14 talks about, Galatians 5 talks about, and something that we'll talk about throughout this series. Let me read first for you Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 12, where it says, So then, believers, brothers, we are debtors. In other words, we owe something, not to the flesh. Bear with me here. To live according to the flesh. That's the other source. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the Spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Okay? Now there is a context to this, but let me just explain how it relates to why we're bringing this into the authority of the Scriptures. Okay? First and foremost, there are two things at work in us, in our hearts, in our lives. Therefore, there are two things at work in us as a group, us as a church. And they are the Spirit, which is one and the same with the Word, and the flesh. Another way of saying it is there are eternal things at work, there are spiritual things at work, and the truth of that, and there are material or fleeting things at work, excuse me. Let me explain this a little further by saying this. Everyone has a friction in their heart. Live by my way, my desires, my every intuition, do what I want when I want, follow the attractions of the body that will be fun for a moment, but in the end will lead to a lack of fulfillment or more wanting and more wanting, and more wanting, and more wanting, and will never satisfy. And eventually, whatever you gain will be lost in death. That's what Romans 8 is talking about. You may not die immediately following the flesh. We all do it. We are all prone to go in that direction. You may not die immediately. That's not what it means. It means that in the end, it leads to a road where you've gained and gained and gained and gained and you've accomplished and accomplished and accomplished and then all of a sudden you die. And what happens to it all if it's all material? What? You tell me. It's gone. It's done. Right? Everything that you worked for is then gone. That's what it's talking about. And although it is a major pull in our lives, we are encouraged not to follow the flesh because that will lead us to destruction. Although it will be difficult, and although the majority of the world is following it, that being the flesh, we are told in the end that's the way to destruction. And yet it's so attractive. Because it seems right 
you know, my thinking, my ways, what's a comfort to me. It, it seems so right. And there are moments when the Word of God is it, so, it, so difficult and it's so troubling and it, it seems so con- contradictory in one sense or another to, to what we hear in the world. Like, oh, is, is that right? And, and, and I would encourage, if you're at that place, that, that, that intersection, so to speak, allow it to work. Okay, more on that in a bit. But we all have this friction in our hearts. Like um, like a mosquito to a bug zapper. You know what I'm talking about? Kids, you might not remember these, like from the 80s or 90s. But when I was growing up, I was at a camp a week and a half ago. And they had these bug zappers up. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about or you're totally lost. Okay, my kids did not raise their hand. They weren't, I mean, they, they've, never, they've never even heard of this. Okay. It's a light that attracts the insect to it, and then the insect flies, because light is very attractive to the insect, right? And it flies in, and all of a sudden, (laughs) they're dead, just like that. Brilliant, but they don't really take the mosquitoes away. At least they didn't at the camp a week and a half ago. (laughs) Anyway, but but that's, that's the picture that's the picture here. It's very attractive, but in the end, it's, it's gone. It's done. It's done just like that. It's, it's momentary. That's the flesh. That's what happens when we follow the flesh. In contrast, that which is eternal and lasting, and although not easy in the moment, the Word of God is fulfilling, it's pure, it's lovely, it offers reward that lasts forever in relationship with our Creator God and will satisfy us and bring us peace. It might be helpful for us to understand that the Word of God, this is actually a Bible uh, from the 1500s. No, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not the 1500s. Sorry. I didn't mean to lie. Um, it, it's probably about 130 years old. Someone gave this to me in church, um, right? 130 or so years old, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and, and as you can see, it's deteriorating. This is written in German, okay? It's, it's old, it's deteriorating, it's not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. In fact, there's pieces of it all over up here. But its content will. Its content will. So what I'm saying is, please understand first and foremost, when I say sola scriptura, I'm saying the word of God, or as Second Timothy says, all scripture is breathed out by God, the breath of God, the breath that he gave us life through is what is eternal. Let me explain this a little further. Don't be mistaken, God has always promised to guide us and speak to us and lead us. However, sometimes the world and our desires and our wants, the flesh, distract us from God's voice at work in our lives through His Spirit. And the Word and the Spirit are the same. And this has been the case since the beginning. So we're going to do a little summer school here, okay? We're going to go back to the beginning. Everyone say thank you. Thank you so much. This is going to be a long one, okay? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, Do you like summer school? Did you, did you like summer school? I went to summer school, Cooper High School. My kids have heard all about it. <laughs> Cooper High School, that's a great place to go to summer school. Anyway, do you know why I went to summer school? I'm not going to talk about why I went to summer school. Anyway, <laughs> how do we know the voice of God from the flesh? Let's get down, let's get down to business here. It's going to take a little bit. Think about this. In the beginning, God spoke into existence all that we we see and smell and feel and taste. The the very first account of mankind tells us that God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils. You can read this in Genesis chapter 1. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So where did life start from? It started from the breath of God, the word of God. That's where life comes from. Life did not start until God breathed His breath into us, and that's true for you. Then what happens? He creates mankind. 
and understand he walked with mankind. They conversed in relationship every day. The word of God breathed into them and walking with them in pure relationship and connection. That is how important in this sense communication is. And there are more forms of communication than just speaking, but you get where I'm going with this. We were designed to walk with God and to be in connection with God. That is What he purposed from the very beginning. Of course, the word of God is at the center of that life. Now that would change. And it's important to understand this aspect of what I'm about to tell you. Because we are told next that Adam and Eve did what they were not to do. They listened to the serpent's voice. Isn't it interesting that they listened to the serpent's voice, then they, and you'll see this in a second, then they listened to their own voice rather than the word of God. It says in Genesis chapter 3, if you want to go there with me, I told you it was going to be summer school. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually, did you hear that? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? What what is he doing? He's trying to manipulate. He's trying to change the word of God. It's the same thing that we're hearing today. Oh, can you trust God's word? Oh, can you trust God's word? Oh, can you trust God's word? Same thing. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither, excuse me, shall you touch it lest you die. Now, did he say don't touch it? No. So she is also seemingly manipulated by the serpent and now being manipulated by his words over God's word. Do you see where I'm going? But, it says, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Think about that. He lies about what God says. Now, maybe they wouldn't die instantly, but there's truth to what he's saying in one sense, but he's manipulating her. Isn't it interesting that with the tongue we manipulate, we still fall into this trap. Verse 5, for God knows, this is what the serpent says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open." He's trying to paint God in a different picture than what Adam and Eve would have known. Same thing we're dealing with today. Oh, did God really say that? Is God really like that? Uh, He's questioning God's God's purposes. He's, He's questioning God's motives. Isn't this interesting? For God knows that when you eat of your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, there was some truth to that. But he's manipulating. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, oh, now we see the part about the flesh. It's already at work. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, there's the flesh. They ate of it. They ate. What's the first characteristic of the voice or the authority of the flesh and the enemy? It it can be summarized as something carnal or something fleeting. Something that is against God's word and manipulation. Carnal. Sometimes we actually use the word, word sexual in this sense but something that is pleasing, something that God made to be pleasing, something that is good, and and yet in its right form, in its right way, in what God intended it to be for. God gave them all the food they needed to eat. He walked with them every day. They were lacking nothing. But what did he say? Not that. And what did they do? That. The first characteristic of the voice of the authority of the flesh is something carnal, something fleeting. Isn't it interesting that we live in a world that tells us that it's good to question everything? Now, now in one sense or another, for the most part, we do. I mean, I'm certainly influenced by that. I I question most things. And, And maybe that's because of my lack of trust in one way or another, but the point is, I do question so many things, and 
it's not so much the questions. God is okay with our questions. In fact, his word answers our questions if we're willing and obedient to it to understand it. But it's not so much the questions, but the intent of the question that's so important. We see that in Genesis. It's not the question. The question wasn't the problem with the serpent and Adam and Eve. It wasn't the question. It was the intent of the question, what he had in the first part and why he wanted to ask them this question, his motives. Isn't it interesting that Adam and Eve did not fall into shame and guilt because what they ate was good looking or or because it was delight or because they, they wondered some things? No, the guilt and the shame came from turning their back on the word of God and following their own opinion. The opinion of something else. What the serpent manipulated was the same message we are hearing today. You can't trust anything but your, what? Yourself. You can't, you can't trust anything but yourself. A- another way of saying it, you do you. You do you. Because that's what you should be doing. You follow your feelings. You follow your heart. And by the way, if Jesus is in your heart, then do it. <laughs> But boy, that's a manipulation of what the Word tells us to do and shows us. Like what makes sense to me should rule my life. What feels right to me is the right way. Of course, the problem with this, though, is that direction will be fun for a moment and can even bring prestige and pleasure for a short time, and yet it will fade away. And it will change. And it is not sure. I mean, if I could deal with my guilt and shame, I would be at peace. But I've recognized I can't. I recognize that I can't take what I've done and just get rid of it. I can't cover it up. In fact, no matter how hard I try to fill my life with things like entertainment and things of pleasure, it never seems to go away. I need a Savior. The the flesh, it's an oppressive authority because you you can never get enough of what you desire. The consequences of turning our back on God's Word, they're transcendent and eternal. And back to our story about Adam and Eve and eating of the fruit, immediately we see, I read it for you, immediately we see the flesh at odds with the Spirit. Immediately what happened to the flesh? They covered themselves up. Look what it says. Look what it says in Genesis 3.8. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Interesting, the word sound there and the word cool of the day. So in other words, the wind. It's the same word for wind. That's the same word for spirit, and that's the same word in the Hebrew for word. The word came. But what did they do? It said they hid themselves from the presence, the spirit of the Lord among the trees of the garden. They felt for the first time shame and guilt. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? It's not that he didn't know. (laughs) Where are you? He was speaking. Even though they had disregarded the word of God, God was still speaking to them. Even though they turned their back on him, he was still speaking to them. He didn't turn their back on him. He loves us so much, he continues to speak. Of course, things had to change, though. Things had to change. They could not be in the garden. It was too dangerous. And understand why. God is holy and almighty. And our approach to Him with sin cannot stand out of love and protection for us. God closed the garden. For with sin, we would surely die being in the presence of God. That's how much He loves us. And it's not that we would die immediately if they ate the fruit. It's that they would die in the presence of God because now they were unholy and they changed our relationship forever. But here's the thing. God would continue to speak through His chosen people. 
As the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he would continue to speak. He picked out one nation that would represent him and his word. And through kings and prophets and priests, he would continue to have relationship despite the separation. Now fast forward to the Gospels where it says, fast forward all the way through the prophets to the Gospels where it says that the word became flesh. John says in verse 14 of chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen His glory. It says later on in verse 17, for the law, the Word, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. He has made Him known. Jesus made His Word known. How do we know that the Word and Spirit are the Bible? He has made it known through His sacrifice for our sins, forgiveness and resurrection. The only one who could conquer sin, death, and the grave has won the victory, and this victory gives Him the authority above all things. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is why Ephesians 1.21 says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name, He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. Jesus is the author. Jesus is the authority. The author is the authority. That's why we follow the authority, because we're following Jesus. We're of Jesus' followers, and He is the Word. God has always promised to guide us, to speak to us, to lead us, and He is not silent. And the nature of following Jesus is that we are led. Why does the church find its authority alone in the Scriptures? Because Jesus is the Word. And how do we know that it's true? And how do we know that it's sure? Because from the beginning of time, it's been true. And forever and ever it will be true. It is eternal. And He showed that in His Son through the Gospels. He tied together the Torah and the Gospels, the Law and the Gospel. And He showed us that it is true. Sometimes people ask me, how do we know the Word is true? And I can tell you, one of the simplest answers you can, you, you can give to one is, is this. If I choose sin and the flesh, if I choose the flesh... It will lead to destruction. It will lead to something that ends. But if I choose the Word of God, it will lead to hope and eternal life. It will lead to something that is lasting and forever. What does it look like? I'm just going to say this in closing. What does it look like for the church to be governed by the Spirit and the Word? I'll do this very quickly. It means that the gospel is at the center of everything we do. It is our heartbeat. See, we receive the word of God, the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ, by faith and humility. Just like Jesus taught his disciples, if you don't become like a child, you cannot even enter the kingdom of God. Not that we are childish, but that we would be childlike and that we trust the Savior Jesus Christ and we entrust our lives to him just like a young little child trusts his parent or his guardian or his helper. They just trust. It's the same thing. And, and then here's what happens. We allow the Spirit's work by the measure of the gospel to lead us. And as we grow in righteousness and godliness, look up here, more and more, the love and the saving work of Christ, we will, it will cause us, excuse me, to be Christ-like and His saving work, not our efforts, not our own merit, not the things we do, but His forgiveness will inform the way we live with each other and what we do in the church. It can all be centered around that truth that His Word, the law and the gospel, and at the center of His Word, as it is lived out, we will be transformed and therefore we will transform those around us. And we will in turn change the world and our eternity. I'd like you to just bow your head for a moment because I think it would be best that in, in a time of prayer 
we recognize that our flesh really has quite the control over us and and therefore over the church and we never want our flesh leading the church and we never want the flesh leading our lives because we know where that leads but our response to this is that we humbly accept and this is a daily thing that his word is true and that it will guide us if we allow it to entrust, entrust him to allow us and lead us And so in, in response to this, as we are bowed in reverence to God, humbly submitting ourselves to Him, the message that He has for our hearts and His Word, I just want to pray over us this. Lord Jesus, would we recognize that our flesh will lead us not in a way we should go or a way that will ever help us to the point that we will be satisfied but it will actually leave us wanting more. But rather your word, which is pure and right and lovely, will lead us to the place where we need to be and that we would be in your peace and in your comfort and surrounded by your presence. And as your spirit, God, does that work inside and as your word does it outside, so to speak, we ask you, Lord God, to open up our hearts to what you want us to hear because we find ourselves so often at this at this crossroads this tension in our lives where we want it we want to follow the flesh we want to go after that and although we know it's not going to end well we want to go after it but lord you want us to follow after your word because that is sure that is right that's eternal and so in that place lord as we would be here now we ask you to, uh, to, to give us willing hearts to accept that there are some things that we don't understand about life and, and eternity and there are some things that, that we don't get and, and, and it's in that place that we have to surrender. All, all mankind have to surrender our questions our concerns and our problems and our cares to you and trust that your word will guide us and your spirit will lead us and in your presence we will have peace despite what the world throws at us so lord we ask you to do that work now in our hearts we take these these minutes not to just take time to go through it but we really pause and we reflect what's leading my life what is my authority is it you is it your spirit lord may it be your spirit that is my prayer over each and every one of us here and at home watching this online may your spirit lead and guide this church for you promise that you have already won the victory and that nothing will prevail against it lord we're so thankful for that and we pray this all praising your name amen